Hyundai's much-improved third-generation i30 delivers smarter looks, a wider variety of body styles, efficient engines, and stronger standards of safety and media connectivity. In short, if you are shopping in the family hatchback segment, it's a product that certainly adds up on paper, but then the i30 always has. Will this one have more lasting real-world appeal against apparently more charismatic rivals? Cast your mind back to 2007. That was the year that the very first Hyundai i30 family hatchback appeared, a focus-sized model that completely changed the way we thought about Korean cars. Since then, this Asian maker has transformed itself from being a budget brand to the point where now it's a mainstream quality choice. That process aided by the launch of this third-generation i30 model in early 2017. Can this significantly improved design help Hyundai progress further in its relentless march to complete automotive credibility? This is, according to its maker, a car for everyone. Except that it isn't. It can't be. Hyundai's product range these days being tailored much more specifically for individual needs. That's why the same kind of money that most i30 models sell for would alternatively buy you the company's Kona SUV. Or if you're more concerned about saving the planet than conquering parts of it, there's the brand's eco-minded Ionic Hybrid, all of which leaves the i30 free to focus a little in every sense. Ford's market leader is one of the family hatchbacks this Korean brand has in its sights with this car, but there are plenty of others, with Vauxhall's Astra, Peugeot's 308, and of course, VW's Golf representing key targets. Take on that lot and you better come well prepared. Fortunately, Hyundai has. This time around, the i30 is stiffer, it's slightly bigger and it's a lot smarter. The petrol engines are all of the new tech TGDI variety and the driving experience has supposedly been improved by changes to the steering and the damping. There are vastly improved levels of camera-driven electronic safety and media connectivity and buyers get the choice of four different variants this time around. So as well as this five-door hatch and its Tourer Estate counterpart, there's also a style orientated five-door fastback coupe and the high-performance i30N hot hatch. All of this from a car that was designed, developed and tested in Europe specifically for European buyers. It all sounds quite promising, doesn't it? But then, if this i30 is going to be able to really keep pace in this closely fought segment, it's going to need to be. So let's put this car to the test. As in other areas, all the right ingredients seem to be in place here for a decent showing when it comes to drive dynamics. Uh, the TGDI and CRDI engines now tick all the right technological boxes and Hyundai has filled its development team with experienced European engineers who know what it takes to make a car of this kind ride and handle with class competitive finesse. Certainly that's what's required here if the Korean brand is to increase its market share and that is quite an ask given that rivals like the Ford Focus and the Volkswagen Golf have spent decades perfecting themselves in that area. Of the two, it's clearly the Volkswagen that has been Hyundai's benchmark in development because in terms of ride and refinement, this i30, like its predecessor, remains very close to the high standard set by that pricier German rival. The sophisticated multi-link rear suspension that made the first and second generation versions of this Korean design so surprisingly good in that regard has been retained and has been improved to the point where on a poor surface you really do feel like you're riding something far more expensive. Few other cars in this class are better at soothing away tarmac imperfections. Assuming you're not in a diesel model at startup where the engine can be a bit clattery, uh, it's also extremely quiet. Uh, there's a reason for that or actually, more accurately, there's several reasons. Uh, this time around, the body is 22% more rigid, thanks to 53% of it now being fashioned from high-strength steel. And that's an unusually high proportion for a relatively affordable family car. 
The advanced suspension further helps here, the design lacking the sharp edges and the clatter of moving parts that you'd typically find in rival setups. Add in things like anti-vibration engine mounts, hollow drive shafts, uh, smoothly profiled door handles and double layer door seals and you begin to get the picture, producing a car that this quiet is all about attention to detail. As for handling, well, claims that the more performance orientated dampers in this Mark III model have significantly improved this are a little wider than the mark. Our perspective is as it was before, namely that there's still scope for improvement here if Hyundai really wants to rival something like a Ford Focus around the twisty stuff. Although we're not actually sure how much point there is in trying to do that, uh, cornering door handle style after all isn't a priority for many of the brand's buyers and in any case, even as it stands, this car is already a match for many of its family hatchback rivals in terms of body control and chassis balance. A little ironically, the main area that's rather lacking in this regard, steering precision, is the one in which the Korean designers devoted quite a lot of effort in development of this third generation design. Uh, the changes made are supposed to have quickened up the steering by around 10%, but that's not a great deal, and to be honest, any difference is difficult to feel. We have few complaints about the engine lineup, though. Uh, that's an area in which Hyundai has clearly done its homework on what appeals to European buyers. A huge number of customers of previous generation i30 models opted for a CRDI diesel, and you can expect that preference to continue going forward, despite their current media negativity towards black pump fuel motoring. The 1.6 litre CRDI unit has been carried over largely unchanged from the previous model, although at launch you could only have that in its lower 110 PS state of tune. Fortunately that is the variant that most people will want and it's a car that offers an appealing blend of performance and efficiency, near on 75 mpg frugality mixed with the ability to reach 62 miles an hour from rest in 11 seconds on the way to 118 mph. Onto the petrol i30 lineup, something Hyundai has worked to improve as part of the third generation range upgrade. Uh, the inefficient old Gamma, Kappa, and 1.6 litre GDI engines that let down the old Mark II models uh, have been junked and replaced by a couple of new technology TGDI units. Many will be drawn to the most affordable option, a three cylinder, one litre, 120 PS unit that's carried over from the brand's smaller i20 Super Mini. It's an efficient and eager little power plant, quite sufficient for the modest needs of most potential i30 buyers. However, it's also one that, in our experience, has to be worked quite hard if you want to get moving with any kind of real speed. Doubtless, the quoted performance stats for this variant, uh, 62 miles an hour from rest in 11.1 seconds on the way to 118 miles an hour, are achievable, but you'd really have to thrash the engine a bit to replicate that claim. It's for that reason that we prefer the rarer 1.4 litre TGDI option we're trying here. This is a four cylinder engine with 140 PS, but it still manages a set of efficiency figures that are really quite close to those of the entry level unit. And thanks to around 40% more pulling power, this power plant is much happier to oblige if you find yourself running a bit late or needing to pull out from a junction too sweet into dense, fast flowing traffic. Uh, 62 miles an hour from rest takes 8.9 seconds en route to 130 miles an hour. That's if you go for the six-speed manual gearbox that all i30 models come fitted with as standard. On this Pokia petrol model, as on the diesel, there's also the option of Hyundai's smooth shifting uh, seven-speed DCT dual-clutch auto transmission. That's one of those setups that's able to pre-select the next gear before you've even left the last one. Thanks to that DCT technology, opting for this self-shifter now has relatively little impact on efficiency too. Is there more to say? Well, only if you want to hear about the top hot hatch variant, the i30N, a shopping rocket that will be of limited interest to typical buyers of this model line, but a car that's of crucial value to Hyundai, improving its engineering credentials to the rest of the European motor industry. Other i30 derivatives had a few handling finishing touches added at the fearsome Nürburgring Nordschleife racetrack, but the N was fully developed there uh, by a team that was led by Albert Biermann. 
Hoffman, who until 2015 was head of BMW's high performance M division. Forget the disappointing old i30 turbo model, the i30N is nothing like that, as proved by successful outings in the Nürburgring's 24 hour saloon car race. Instead, what's been delivered is a properly hardcore front driven hot hatch uh, in the Honda Civic Type R mold, powered by a 290 PS 2 litre turbo engine fitted up with electronic dampers and an electronic diff and able to hit 62 miles an hour in just six seconds. But back once more to the car that we're driving here. Now it delivers a lot of the feel of a bigger, more expensive model, but it still remains one compact enough to nip around city streets with plenty of agility, thanks to light steering and a tight turning circle. So yes, as we've said, this Hyundai may uh, still lack a touch of dynamic focus, but in terms of the day-to-day -day things that family hatch buyers really care about, it really does tick a lot of boxes. When Hyundai developed their very first i30 model back in 2007, exterior design wasn't really top of the priority list. Five years later, though, at the launch of that design's second-generation replacement, we noted that the brand had put far more work into styling and packaging, an emphasis that has paid off since, with customers apparently rating this car's pleasing design as their number one reason for purchase. Hence all of the effort that's been put into the look of this Mark III model, which adopts a sharper, sleeker and leaner look than before. As one writer put it, it's now more Prada than Primark. Get a real feel for that here at the front, where the main change is the adoption of what Hyundai calls its cascading grille. Now here, a satin silver frame surrounds chrome-plated elements that are arranged in downward tapering rows in a form supposed to be inspired by the flow of molten steel. Either side of this trapezoidally shaped main intake lie more distinctive headlights that does here feature full LED illumination on the plusher models. Below them are side vents incorporating fog lights and vertically angled LED daytime running light strips that also double as the indicators. Uh, the profile is rather less distinctive, lacking the angular raked shaping of the previous generation model in favour of horizontally shaped creases and a more practical boxier silhouette that's not unlike that of a rival Peugeot 308. At least the long bonnet and the short front and rear overhangs uh, do their bit to try and inject a bit of purpose into proceedings. And there is a lower crease to uh, give the flank some shape and that separates wheel arches that house rims that are between 15 and 17 inches in size depending on the variant you select. Now there is also a Tura estate body shape but if you want something more visually arresting than either of the standard body styles can provide then your dealer will steer you towards the uh, fastback coupe i30 variant that's created more with the fashionistas in mind. Move to the rear and again you'll find the emphasis has been on creating a clean, uncluttered look. Uh, these sweeping horizontal creases, they're supposed to make the car look wider, while sculpted LED light clusters and these high-set rear reflectors deliver a more distinctive look at night. Of course, as usual, what's more important is the stuff that you can't see. Now, most of the basic structure of this design is shared with the previous generation model, but it has been comprehensively overhauled. Uh, Hyundai has doubled the amount of high strength steel in the body yet it's managed to shed weight along the way so the bare shell now tips the scales at 28 kilos less than the previous generation model. Now in terms of size this Mark III model is a fraction bigger than its predecessor but that doesn't mean that it's particularly large by class standards. Uh, it's 4.34 meters long and nearly 1.8 meters wide so uh, to give you some perspective on that it makes it slightly shorter and slightly narrower than a rival Vauxhall Astra. Enough of that, let's take a seat at the wheel. Now, if you happen to be familiar with the previous model, or indeed almost any Hyundai produced over the last few years, your first impression will probably be that quality has gone up a notch or two. It's all much more Volkswagen Golf-like, which is presumably what the Koreans were aiming at. So there's uh, much more chrome, silver and piano black trimming. Most of the things you regularly touch feel very pleasant to your fingertips, and cheaper materials are better hidden than is the case with most rivals. Now, there's actually not a lot more room in here than there was in the last generation i30, but the area, less cluttered, horizontally orientated design effectively creates the illusion of extra space. 
The biggest cabin talking point is this 8-inch colour touchscreen, although bear in mind that you'll only get that if you can avoid the two lower spec trim levels. Now it isn't as neatly integrated into the dash as the top spec monitor in the previous generation model used to be, but that's intentional. Hyundai have striven to copy the floating iPad stuck on top of the dashboard effect that the premium German brands seem to like so much. Uh, there's no separate iDrive style control for this display, such as you get in a rival Mazda 3 say but we do like the ease of use of this setup with its clear neat graphics and usefully large flanking shortcut buttons now this is your interface for controlling satellite navigation uh, the DAB audio setup and a package of TomTom Tom live services that alert you to speed cameras update you on the weather and provide accurate information on traffic jams and roadworks now you can also connect in your handset using the Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone mirroring systems Getting comfortable is easy thanks to plenty of seat and wheel adjustment, plus electrically adjustable lumbar support is standard providing you avoid entry level trim. Uh, other things we like include the grippy three spoke leather trimmed multifunction steering wheel and it's just the right thickness. Now through this you view two clearly presented dials that are separated either by a simple trip computer or by the classier looking 4.2 inch driver's uh, supervision cluster display that is fitted to plusher models like this one. Not so good though is rearward visibility. Now we'd expected that the uh, boxier shape this time around might help here, but thanks to that small rear screen and those relatively thick rear pillars, over the shoulder vision remains a little compromised for tight parking maneuvers. Now Hyundai is apparently aware of this, which is why rear parking sensors and a rear view camera come as standard above entry level trim. Cabin practicality is reasonable with bottle holders in the door pockets, uh, an overhead compartment for your sunglasses and this lidded storage compartment under the ventilation controls which has uh, USB, aux in and 12 volt sockets in it. Plus there's a wireless phone charging mat if your i30 has been fitted out with that 8 inch colour touchscreen. Uh, you also get a reasonably spacious glove box, this central storage bin with a 12 volt socket and this pair of cup holders that are covered by this sliding top, although small bottles placed in those will get in the way of your route to the gear lever. Premium models also get this electronic handbrake and that frees up space for a narrow storage area just behind it. Uh, now one final point, if Hyundai really does want to design a car for Europeans, it really has to get with the fact that by and large European buyers don't want a chintzy little musical chime before they start the car up. Time to take a seat in the back. Now you get these wide opening doors and the more squarely orientated roof makes rear access easier with this car than it was in the previous generation model. And once inside, um, well, what can we tell you? It's not the roomiest rear cabin in the class. Uh, you'll need a Skoda Octavia for that. But by the standards of most other family hatch segment contenders, other space provided here is quite competitive and it's probably as much as most buyers will need. As with most other cars in the segment, it's not possible to sit three fully sized adults back here with any real degree of comfort. But if there are only two of you, then you'll find that there's reasonable space for legs, knees and shoulders. Uh, those approaching six foot in height could find their heads brushing the ceiling though. The larger side windows this time around make it feel less claustrophobic than it was on the previous generation model. Uh, rear folk get their own vents too, these positioned just above this reasonably low transmission tunnel. Netted mat pockets in the back of the front seats provide somewhere to pack loose items and there are small bins in both doors. Plus there are ice fixed child seat mounts on the two outer chairs and you get twin cup holders in this centre armrest. Finally, let's take a look in this Hyundai's boot. Now the tailgate is simple to open thanks to a proper handle here in the panel. And that's something that some rivals now don't bother with. Uh, it's light to lift up and it opens to reveal a low loading sill and a large entrance. So getting bigger, heavier boxes in and out is straightforward. Uh, the 395 litre cargo capacity is class competitive. It's 15 litres more than you get in the Golf and 25 litres more than you get in an Astra. Although plenty of other contenders in this class do offer more.
A variable height boot floor allows you to create more space when it's required, or you can simply store valuables safely out of sight beneath it. Uh, four securing rings help lash items down, and you also get a 12 volt socket and a couple of hooks in the upper side trims to stop your shopping bags from spilling all over the carpet. If you need more space and you want to push the rear backrest down, uh, then there's up to 1,301 litres of carrying capacity available in this configuration. The days are long gone since Hyundai's were available at bargain basement pricing, but that doesn't mean that the Marks models can't still be seen as good value. This third generation i30 is a case in point. Now, the basic range is built around a five door hatchback lineup priced in the 17 to 25,000 pound bracket. Uh, there's no three door hatch body shape this time around. As before, though, there is the option of a Tourer Estate version. Expect a premium of around 1,000 pounds for that. You can also ask your dealer about the five-door fastback coupe i30 variant that Hyundai has developed for those who prioritize style over space. There's a lot of choice on offer then to potential i30 buyers, and that's choice that this model line will need, not only to differentiate itself from the competition, but also from arguably more eye-catching options within Hyundai's own model lineup. After all, the same kind of budget that you'd pay for a mid-spec i30 could also get you the brand's more eco-conscious Ionic hybrid. Or if you don't like that, well, what about the company's trendy Kona SUV? Now, Hyundai knows that models like these might be tempting for a proportion of potential i30 customers, but it's likely that the majority of them will still be happier with something more conventional, uh, probably the straightforward five-door hatch i30 body shape that is going to represent our focus here. So engine-wise, uh, buyers get a couple of TGDI petrol options, a base 120 PS 1 litre unit, and this 140 PS 1.4 litre power plant. Alternatively, there is a 110 PS 1.6 litre CRDI diesel derivative that's priced from around £20,000. Now go for that or this 1.4 litre petrol variant, and providing you're prepared to stretch to one of the higher trim levels, your dealer will offer you the option of the brand's smoothly efficient 7-speed DCT automatic gearbox for an extra £1,000. Hot hatch buyers are also catered for by the i30 range this time around, thanks to the high-performance i30N model, and that's powered by a potent 290 PS 2-litre turbo. So, on to the value proposition those figures represent. Uh, the top petrol and diesel versions do seem a little optimistically priced. Uh, Hyundai points to high equipment levels as justification, but otherwise the figures being asked seem very competitive. Now, true, this i30 model is undercut quite significantly on price by the Kia Seed family hatch model that's made by the same Korean conglomerate. But at the time of the launch of this Mark III i30 range in spring 2017, the Seed was a model generation behind, so you would expect it to be cheaper. Hyundai, though, wants this car to be considered by the kind of customers who would normally be thinking about family hatchment segment heavy hitters like Volkswagen's Golf, Ford's Focus and Vauxhall's Astra. And price-wise, it does seem well-placed to take those rivals on. Uh, Hyundai's list figures are slightly undercut by those of an Astra, but they'll typically see you paying around £1,000 less than you'd have to find for a Golf or a Focus. We think, though, that it's more likely that potential i30 buyers will come from the ranks of people wanting something a little different in this segment and who are looking at popular choices like Peugeot's 308, Renault's Megane, uh, Honda Civic, Seat's Leon, Citroen C4 and Skoda's Octavia. Now, nearly all of these rivals can undercut Hyundai's pricing by £1,000 or so when it comes to the diesel engine option. In terms of petrol power, though, the i30 emerges as one of the most affordable choices out there if you want one of the new generation of high-tech downsized three-cylinder engines rather than some old nail that's going to be less economic and which will be pricier to tax. Now, if you were prepared to further widen your options in this segment, a little more cash would get you into certain versions of the Toyota Auris and the Mazda 3 that directly compete, uh, but you probably need a couple of thousand more to get yourself into a Mini Clubman. 
That only leaves the really cheap area of this segment, uh, the inexpensive part of the class that this Hyundai would once have competed in. Uh, in rough model for model terms, you could save as much as three and a half thousand pounds or so if you were to choose, say, an equivalent Fiat Tipo or Nissan Pulsar. Hyundai would argue, with some validity, that you get a lot less sophistication with much cheaper family hatchback models of that sort. They're banking on the expectation that most potential buyers will be prepared to stump up a little more to get something a little nicer. Something like this. Enough on price and marking comparisons. Let's assume that you've decided on a mainstream i30 model and you want to know exactly what you're gonna get for your money. Well, a pretty reasonable amount as it happens. Even entry level S variants get 15 inch alloy wheels, LED daytime running lights, uh, automatic headlamps, air conditioning, Bluetooth phone connectivity and a DAB radio. Plus uh, there's cruise control with a speed limiter, a variable height boot floor and some significant electronic camera driven safety features that many rivals will charge you more for. So we're going to talk about those in more detail in a few minutes. Uh, most i30 buyers though will want to at least get themselves into SE spec and that's the next trim level up. Uh, so additions for SE buyers include larger 16 inch alloy wheels, power folding door mirrors, front fog lights and a space saver spare wheel. Inside there's a rear parking camera with rear parking sensors, uh, powered driver's seat lumbar support, a ski hatch for the rear bench and a 5 inch center dash touchscreen media center display. But what about all the sophisticated media connectivity that Hyundai promises in the advertising it's placed around this car? Well, to get that, you have to stretch to mid-range SE nav trim, which will set you back a further thousand pounds or so over the standard SE variant. In return for the extra cash, uh, you really do get properly connected. Uh, the center dash touchscreen increases in size to eight inches, and it includes navigation as well as a traffic messaging channel and Hyundai's map care and live services that aim to keep you bang up to date with what's happening on the roads. Uh, the screen will also let you attach smart devices to the car using the Apple CarPlay or Android Auto systems, while a wireless phone charging pad in the front tray tops up your handset's battery without the need to attach any cables. We think SE nav trim is pretty much all you really need in an i30, but of course, if budget permits, it is possible to go further. Here, for example, we're trying a premium spec model, and that adds in 17-inch alloy wheels, LED headlamps, rain-sensing wipers, rear privacy glass, front parking sensors, and a smart key keyless entry and start system. Inside, the premium spec gives you part faux leather upholstery, heated powered front seats, dual zone climate control, a 4 2-inch LCD driver supervision instrument cluster display in the instrument binnacle and an auto defog system that uh, clears the windscreen more quickly on misty days. At the top of the range, if you really must have almost everything on the options list fitted as standard, then premium SE spec gives you full leather upholstery, a heated steering wheel and a powered panoramic sunroof. On to options. Now, as usual with Hyundai, there really aren't that many. Uh, the brand believing that customers will prefer to move up a trim level rather than go box ticking. It is worth mentioning, though, that on volume SE nav variants, you can get nearly all of the key niceties that are fitted to this premium trim model by paying extra for a visibility pack. And that includes 17-inch alloy wheels, LED headlamps, dual zone climate control and that auto defog system. As for individual items, well, we would want to peruse a few practicalities. There are the usual mud guards and carpet mats, plus liners and mats for the boot area, a protective foil to shield the rear bumper from loading scrapes, uh, door entry sill guards and roof bars. You might also want rear parking sensors if the variant you've chosen doesn't have those. And of course, there's the option of a tow bar if you need it. Uh, as for comfort and aesthetics, uh, well, the starting point will be your choice between the various metallic and pearl finish colours. We've got optional platinum silver here. Uh, there are differently styled alloy wheels in 15, 16 and 17 inch rim sizes and you can add extra chrome trimming along the side panels, on the tailgate and around the wing mirror housings. Inside you can add LED footwell illumination for the front and the rear. Plus if you want there are LED door projectors that will display an i30 logo on the ground as you get out at night. 
So let's finish with a perusal of the safety stuff on offer. And that's the area in which the specification of this car has taken its biggest step forward. While most other rivals only fit the choicest high-tech camera-driven features on their very priciest variants, Hyundai gives you pretty much everything you'll need right across the range, which means that an autonomous emergency braking system, including forward collision warning, comes as standard. Now, this is a kind of setup that, as you drive, will scan the road ahead, search for potential collision hazards. So if one's detected, you'll be warned. Uh, if you don't respond, or perhaps you aren't able to, the brakes will automatically be applied to decrease the severity of any resulting accident. The other noteworthy standard fit camera-driven feature is the lane departure warning system with lane keep assist setup. Now this will warn you if the car is unintentionally wandering over a road marking before gently steering the i30 back to where it ought to be. Other standard safety features are more familiar. Uh, there are twin front side and curtain airbags, Isofix rear child seat fastenings, and active front head restraints that prevent whiplash. In addition, as usual with a family hatch of this kind, there is ESC, electronic stability control, uh, tire pressure monitoring, and hill start assist control to stop the car from rolling backwards as you pull away on inclines. Uh, as you'd also now expect in this segment, the ABS anti-lock brakes are aided in panic stops by a brake assist feature, plus an emergency stop signal that flashes the hazard lights to warn following motorists. In addition, a standard driver attention alert system monitors for signs of fatigue and will prompt you to take a break during a journey. If you want more, you'll have to stretch to a premium spec variant like the one we're trying here. Do that and you'll also get two further camera-driven features. Blind spot detection works on the move to stop you from dangerously pulling out if there's a vehicle in your blind spot. And rear cross traffic alert is there for when you're backing out to let you know if any vehicles are approaching from the side. With previous generation i30 models, buyers were usually faced with a selection of old tech, rather inefficient petrol engines and some relatively frugal diesels. This time around, the petrol issue has been sorted. The old Gamma, Kappa and 1.6 litre GDI units are last dispensed with and replaced by power plants featuring the brand's latest TGDI technology. Uh, that in turn has now meant that every i30 can now feature the brand's ISG, Intelligent Stop and Go technology, that cuts the engine when you don't need it when you're stuck in traffic or waiting at the lights. There's more too. Significant weight savings this time around have been made and greater emphasis has been placed on aerodynamics with air curtains on each side of the front bumper and an active air flap behind the front grille. As a result, this car's drag coefficient has been reduced to a much sleeker 0.30 CD. And finally, another previous brand failing, old-fashioned automatics that had a massively detrimental impact on running costs has also been dealt with in recent times thanks to the introduction of the company's optional 7DCT dual clutch auto transmission. All of this should mean that this third generation i30 ought now to have all the tools required for a really class competitive efficiency performance. So let's see how it does. Uh, let's start where a lot of customers will with the base 120 bhp 1 litre TGDI petrol model. This three cylinder variant manages 56.5 mpg on the combined cycle and 115 grams per kilometre of CO2. That is still a fraction behind the class standard, but it certainly brings Hyundai a lot closer to where it needs to be. And the same applies to the readings that you'll get from the Pokia petrol unit that we're trying here, the four-cylinder 140 PS 1.4 litre TGDI model. Uh, here, the NEDC figures suggest you'll get 52.3 mpg and 124 grams per kilometre of CO2. You can also have this 1.4 litre unit with that 7DCT auto gearbox, which will have only a fractional impact on the running cost figures. To do better, you will of course need the 110 PS 1.6 litre CRDI diesel unit. Uh, when it's mated to a manual box, this delivers 74.3 mpg on the combined cycle, along with 99 grams per kilometre of carbon dioxide. Uh, go for the auto and those figures fall to 68.9 mpg and 109 grams per kilometre. What else might you need to know? Um, 
Uh, likely residual values, well, they're a lot higher than they used to be on mainstream Hyundai models. Uh, independent experts reckon that after three years and 30,000 miles, your i30 will still be worth between 38.5 and 41% of what you originally paid for it, and that depends on the variant you select. Uh, an even stronger buying incentive is the five-year unlimited mileage warranty, and that comes as standard. Uh, it's backed up by breakdown cover that lasts the same length of time and free annual vehicle health checks over the duration. True rival brand Kia claims to better this package by offering a similar seven-year deal, but there you're limited to 100,000 miles. As for servicing, well, your i30 will need a garage visit once a year or every 10,000 miles, whichever comes around sooner. Um, if you want to budget ahead for routine maintenance, then there are various Hyundai Sense packages that offer fixed price servicing over two, three, or five-year periods. Uh, you can pay for your plan monthly, and you can add MOTs into the three- and five-year plans for an extra fee. The final financial consideration is insurance. Uh, you're looking at groupings of either 8E or 9E for the 1 litre TGDI or 14E or 15E for this 1.4 litre TGDI variant. Uh, the diesel is rated at 10E, 11E or 12E depending on derivative. You may have read or seen reviews elsewhere suggesting that this third generation i30 is a car without standout qualities. That isn't true. We think that this is the most refined car in the family hatchback class and it also possibly offers the best quality of ride you'll find in the segment. The level of standard safety kit is unbettered in this sector too. Plus, this Hyundai also makes the grade when it comes to the important questions of practicality and media connectivity. With all that said, though, we do understand why some struggle to warm to this model, at least in its standard form. Uh, this Korean brand stated aim that this should be a car for everyone, apart from being impossible to achieve, is also a recipe for what could have been a very compromised end result. The lazy way to review this car is to dismiss it in just that way. Live with it, though, as we have done as part of this test, and the attributes I mentioned earlier begin to shine through. For complete desirability in this segment, you sense that in the future, a touch of unpredictability might be needed from Hyundai when it comes to a volume seller of this sort. Something truly groundbreaking that still ticks all the boxes on every family hatch buyer's wish list. Now, we have little doubt that one day the brand will provide it. Indeed, the i30N hot hatch variant and the fastback coupe body style developed for this model prove the company's willingness to take that step. In the meantime, though, what we already have here is still enough to leave the industry's more established car makers with furrowed brows. Ultimately, it's hard to do too much better for the money, which means that, for the time being at least, the eyes still have it. <laughs>